Hello guys, my name is Ashton Gleckman. I'm here with the Global Composers Network, one of Facebook's newest top resources for composers, musicians, and orchestrators. We discuss composition, media scoring, and tech. We also have challenges that bring composers together from all around the world. Um, today I'm here, I'm pleased to be joined by Gareth Coker, who's a fantastic video game and film composer. He's known for projects like Ori and the Blind Forest and its follow-up game Ori and the Will of Wisps, The Unspoken, Arc Survival Evolved, and so much more. His style is characterized by powerful visceral soundscapes, lush orchestration, and gripping thematic material. Gareth, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks so much. I'm uh, honored to be the first. I'll, uh, I'll try and set the bar really low so that whoever's following me can, can do a better job. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. All right, so the first question I just wanted to get um, to start out with is I want to talk a little bit about your career, how you got started in music. So the first question is, how did you get started in music and what was your first experience you remember with film slash game music? Um, okay, so I got, I can go right back to the beginning. Uh, when I was eight, my parents bought me piano lessons and I hated it. Um, and I really wasn't, really was, didn't have much of an interest in like learning music. Um, and then also when I was eight, they sent me to boarding school and I was like, wow, I, I guess my parents really don't like me, but boarding, going to boarding school in England is actually okay. Um, and at boarding school, there's really nothing to do, like, especially at the weekends. Um, so I just started practicing like crazy. Um, and then, well, if you practice a lot, you, you, you get better. Um, and then I guess after a while like i became i became decent at improvising i was in the school jazz band i was in the school orchestra but i i was a, a, a lot of the stuff i was doing at the beginning of my career was was jazz based and i think the improvisation helped like start getting me interest started to get me interested in actually composing but i'll be honest i didn't really like write my first piece of music until i was like 17. um and then like six months later i'm applying to the royal academy of music and I really had no idea like how I got accepted. Um, and I did actually ask my professor at the time, you know, why did you pick me? And he basically said, well, because you can write a melody. And if you can do that, uh, the rest of the stuff you can teach, um, but it's quite hard to like, I mean, you can teach how to write a melody. There's like all sorts of shortcuts you can you can take to like get you over a certain point. But he was like, that's the that's basically the reason why we picked you. And then while I was at the academy, I'd learned all the orchestration and the arranging and all, all the rest of it. Um, in terms of my first encounter, like first becoming aware of film and game music, um, probably when I saw Forrest Gump for the first time, and then immediately after seeing that film, uh, I think we just went to the music store and it just like the sheet music for the main title theme was available for piano, and that was uh, that was one of the first pieces I uh, like first definitely the first piece of film music I learned on the piano for sure, um, and that's kind of stayed with me. Uh, and you know, funnily enough, that's also got an incredibly strong melody. So um, that probably um like i really like the approach of the especially the 90s film scores because they're they're not particularly subtle and i think that's okay um i i quite like uh, i quite like the the bold bold thematic stuff like the, it's like they weren't afraid to make a statement um because that theme goes on for like three minutes at the beginning of the film that's a long opening title no matter which way you look at it it's a long time to look at a feather <laughs> <laughs> but it's a perfect example of how a composer just takes one specific idea and he just sort of enriches it and modulates it and, and uh, uses orchestration as his main tool to keep the viewer engaged in it, I think, which is it's a fantastic yep. score. So it's definitely yes, a great score to, uh, to start a composer off. So um, this, yep. that leads us into the second question. So what were some of your biggest influences in your development? So this could be composers, movies, games. That sort of has to do with that, um, what you were saying about Forrest Gump. So what were some composers that were very influential in your own style? Um, I think in terms of uh, 
film and just classical composers in general um i always i always tend to come back to ravel on this answer because ravel is the the god of orchestration in in my in my eyes at least um especially in terms of like how to orchestrate for film like you can just look at most of the textures that ravel wrote and they are literally lifted <laughs> almost every day in and you'll 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 see or hear a film score and you you if, if it was recorded with the orchestra you'll probably hear a ravel influence in there um i just happen to really like that sound as well which really helps um in terms of film composers i mean it's kind of all over the map because you know Every, every so often like a film composer comes up with a new sound and that's in vogue for a while um but i'll give you i'll give you some names um tom newman james newton howard michael danner uh those are probably the three i and there is kind of like a, a little bit of a cross section between between those three composers but i particularly like michael danner because of his um i think he is the best at combining music from the rest of the world uh with the conventional western hollywood soundtrack um obviously best uh, shown in life of pi but if you listen to all of his scores prior to life of pi he's been doing that for years and life of pi was like the vehicle that allowed him to show what he's been doing for years on a massive stage yeah absolutely so what was it about the relationship between visual media and music that that sort of tugged at your emotion and sort of made you want to go into uh music for visual media um, I mean, this this is such a, a standard answer, but it's it's really like the the opportunity to tell stories with music. I've always enjoyed seeing other people react to my music. Like that's, that's I guess that's partially an ego thing, but it's also just fun to see. You know, it's fun to get a response from your work. It doesn't matter. Like it, I don't even care if it's bad. I don't even care if someone says they like it because at least they responded to it. Um, but like, for example, with with Ori like the amount of twitch streams that i've watched of people watching the opening or uh getting you know such satisfaction from completing one of the the famous like chase sequences from the game um that never gets old like and and we announced the uh, we announced the sequel like a month ago and there was a renewed interest in the original game and so you know i've been i've been going on to twitch again and just watching other people play i guess i would say stalking them but like uh it's uh it's it's just real like i don't think you can get that in any other medium it's not like you can see the audience's reaction during a film because unless you've got an infrared camera you can't really see their faces but with twitch twitch is such a unique medium um for for games that you really can get great feedback uh on how you are doing like with your with your design with your music with your art um we we're lucky with Ori because we have the help of Microsoft, so we kind of get to do the uh, the testing with someone like watching. There's there's Microsoft testing. Basically, there's a camera watching you at all times. There's a camera on your hands. There's a camera like on the screen. So like there's uh, we kind of get a little bit of that. But like with with Twitch, it's real people playing your game in real time and reacting in real time. Like you you can't really get that anywhere else. And so not only is it a learning experience but it's also it's just really enjoyable because you get to see what you did right and you get to see you know you get to see what you did wrong and there are there are things in ori i would go back and change but you know it's done now um so uh what project in your career has taught you the most you know through through the writing process or just simply through the experience of composing for that project <laughs> all of them i mean that like seriously the the project i've learned from the most is the one i just finished because like I don't know it it just just when it seems like you figured everything out uh something something new comes up like cuz cuz every project is completely different it has it has its own set of requirements it has um you know it has its own instrumentation it has its own melodies it has its own implementation into the game um the score i just finished recording was for arc survival evolved now that was a new experience because it was my first time to london it was my first time recording with a 93 piece orchestra biggest be before that was 65 um and 93 is a big jump from 65 um plus uh just the experience alone of stepping into studio one and you know thinking about all the soundtracks that have been recorded there i mean literally like every not every major film score but a lot of the big ones um it, it was the first time i i'd ever had like I, I, imposter syndrome because i've got i've got the philharmonia orchestra in front of me i've got simon rhodes who recorded uh, avatar uh, engineering my session um and i'm standing in studio one and i'm like 
okay i'm like the the weakest link in the chain here um but uh you know you get it done and you figure it out and there's there's unique problems that that come up when you're when you're hiring like that number of players and you know if, if one even if even if there's like one error in the score like it can take it can take like two minutes to solve because what happens is is when one person finds an error then the rest of the orchestra starts looking for errors and then and then chaos can happen very very quickly in the recording if you've not got your stuff together and it must um, be pretty pressuring because you have you know people who are paying money to to have you at that studio and so mistakes are always yes it's not it's expensive. not cheap to, to to spend three days uh with 90 because because we did it all in the room at the same time um we did not do any striping um and you know that worked out well um that's that's something i can spend like a lifetime on whether to record strings and brass separately or whether to record everyone in the room at the same time but like i know uh, that i know that sometimes like alan myerson for example will have them record like strings short strings long have you ever had a situation where the mixing engineer wanted you to record separate your articulations for the mixing process or have you always wanted the musicians to all record together i generally th there's been a couple of times when we've recorded a couple of lines separately just it's usually just for safety reasons but like sometimes it can help in the mix it really but it also it it depends on what kind of mix you are going for like the i mean the i don't know the extent uh to which alan myerson goes into like the fine tuning of like the mixes but i i do know like his thing is you know getting a lot of the stuff separately and the mixes sound super clean it's undeniable um and they have all of the time in the world to like get it to a good performance level um but generally speaking i you know most games have decent budgets but they don't have the kind of budgets where you can just spend two weeks like and um, locking out studio one um and just recording strings um you know, we we had to record about 130 minutes of music in three days, which for 90 players is is a lot. And this is not like this is not Ori. It's the opposite of Ori. It's all combat music. It's all really loud, super epic combat music. So uh, there's there's a lot going on. Um, I think we could have gotten more done if it was if it was a softer score, but it but it wasn't. Um, so when when you are recording everyone in the room you you'd better make sure your orchestration is good uh that's that's the one thing and i'm gonna be honest like i like my i think my orchestration is fine but you know i just don't have the experience like that's the um so i i generally play it safe with the orchestration um i'm not doing anything like super crazy but oftentimes that's the best solution is to not do anything crazy at all um but um yeah like so if your orchestration is good then it makes it easier to record everything in the room at the same time and uh, i mean one thing that is pretty certain is that the players love it um and when the players love it they love you and they want to do the best they can for you now of course like it's not that the players don't love playing you know sessions period but generally speaking you'll get a lot i th in my limit very limited experience you'll get a, a much better vibe in the room if everyone is in there together um but that said there are times when you do need to grab things separately because if you're writing fortissimo brass it doesn't matter how good the string section is or how well balanced it is it's fortissimo brass and it's going to destroy everything um so i would say for arc about 80 percent of it is all in the room and then 20 percent of it is uh, strings and woodwind on one pass and then brass on the other and generally speaking that got us over the line it sounds i'm biased obviously but i think it sounds pretty good <laughs> gotcha um, yeah do you think that do you think that might because you do you orchestrate your own stuff uh, for Ark, I orchestrated the entire core game and I left the expansions to uh, my two colleagues, uh, Zach Lemon and Alex Rudd, uh, who I've worked with since I um, went to school at USC with them. Um, and Alex is also my conductor. I don't conduct. Um, I can conduct, but I don't. Um, although I did I did conduct... Sorry. I, I, I did conduct the last hour at Abbey Road, but it was really just for fun because uh, we were basically done. Um, sorry go ahead yeah so i would presume like one of the issues is like the translation between your sort of midi mock-up and then like the live performance a lot of the times <laughs> samples lie to us in terms of you know and and the availability that we have when we're composing in a computer um to sort of control everything like we could have like low flutes at the top of a brass section which would never you know be able to actually happen with the real orchestra so um would you imagine one of the issues of somebody recording with a 
live orchestra for the first time uh, when they weren't heavily involved in the actual orchestration process um, is the the balance and everything like that yeah i mean if you're doing if you're writing low flute over high brass with the samples and you expect that to sound the same well that's that's just bad like just don't do that like or just or just record it separately um but if you're expecting it to sound good in the room then well then good luck um but uh you know i mean even then like even if you've got a brilliant orchestrator there's still going to be things that don't sound exactly the same or exactly how you expected it um expected it to and for arc like there's still some times like in the mix where i'm i'm going to the samples to to support like to support the live stuff because there is there's there's one part in one of the tracks which is like it's got a, a bunch of really loud fortissimo brass stabs but you can't do that for three minutes even if they are taking a even if there's room for them to breathe you can't play fortissimo brass stabs for like two minutes it's impossible but it's really easy to do that on when you've got your amazing spitfire samples which have like the great stabby brass sound um but you but you can't do that for two minutes i mean you can do it for like 20 to 30 seconds but that it's just not going to sound the same in the last 20 seconds it is in the first and yes we could have recorded like four measures and four measures and four measures and gotten the whole thing but that sounds really boring and an incredible waste of time um so we just didn't do it um and i was just like well we'll just layer in the samples because the samples these days are good enough um and there's certain i, th I think with the translation from samples to mock-up for me it's less about the balance it's more about the feel um if you're good at, if you're a good mock-up artist to me is not who sounds the most realistic it's who's who translates the most feeling in the music uh i don't really care if it like my mock-up doesn't sound realistic what is realistic these days anyway like the only thing that's realistic is like the actual orchestra in the room if you can get it to sound like that with your mock-up well great job but i th i think that's like an incredible time time sink that most composers don't have time for unless they have permanent mock-up artists which if you're working at the highest level you might be able to do um but frankly speaking if you're working like one or two or three people which 99 percent of us are you don't have time to make it sound like a real orchestra so you've got like the thing i focus on first is like translating the feeling um in my mock-ups and i'll be honest like some of my you know most epic tracks like we did for arc they only have like 21 21 tracks in the sequence because the ensemble patches are enough and you have enough control of them to get the right feeling um and if you can get the right feeling in your music that's what sells it to the director and then all you have to do is figure out how to get that exact same feeling in the live session that can be easier said than done um but yeah, my my focus on mock-up is getting getting the right feeling. I think if you focus too much on realism, it can actually suck the feeling out of the music. Um, but that's just me. There are lots of approach ways of approaching, approaching it, obviously. obviously. So how how important do you feel it is for the players to really know what they're playing for, like for them to really feel and understand the story <laughs> of what they're you know performing? Oh, I think that's incredibly important. Even if it's just like a simple performance instruction, like. Um, yeah arc is a game which you know it's there's a lot of dinosaurs in the game so i just put like you know in the instruction the score you know a t-rex is chasing you like and that can be enough but like i mean towards i think on the third day we we put inflatable dinosaurs on the on the balcony of abbey road which i i know sounds really silly but like the game is quite over the top and ridiculous and it kind of like got them into the right frame of mind oh it's that kind of project um i would never do that with with ori obviously i wouldn't like have an inflatable ori like sitting on the podium or like the soft toy that we just made um but you know it's i i think i think if you can like just sum up in like two sentences what a cue is about to the players and say it in a way that's entertaining um then you've 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 gotten them in in the zone um very very quickly and and also if you're recording with them for like a you know a three-day period they're going to get the feel like after the opening hour um assuming that the score is generally consistent from start to finish um but i especially when everyone's in the room uh it really does make a difference because a lot about making good music to me is about chemistry and it's not just chemistry within the orchestra it's chemistry within the entire team the engineer the orchestrators the conductor the composer like the players can tell when the conductor doesn't like the composer 
Um, Because I've seen sessions where this is the case. Um, And the players can also tell when the conductor and the composer are having an amazing time. Uh, Now, Alex, my conductor, he is this really super cheerful, big blue eyes, long hair, happy-go-lucky British guy from the north. So he's like the good cop, and I'm like the bad cop, because I'm more stoic and serious. And that's fine. So, like, he... He's able to entertain the orchestra and tell stories while I'm just deciding what to do. And that's why he's out there and I'm in the booth. And it just works It just works really well like that. And when you've worked with someone for eight years and you kind of know everything about them and he knows everything about me, um, there's there's a chemistry there that happens. And if you look, if you look at all the major composers, they've had the same s- similar teams for most of their careers, or they, they at least have one or two guys that are always there. Um, like how long have Hans and Lorne Balfe been working together, for example? Or and John I would imagine, and, and, and I would imagine Pope. that, and I would imagine that the conductor is such an important part because I remember Conrad Pope saying something like, "It isn't about like you know conducting a performance; it's about no. releasing a performance, no. and it's about it's about giving the orchestra the energy that they need to be able to play the best that they possibly can." So I'd imagine that it's a very important part to find, a, yeah, a fi- find a perfect conductor. So you started out scoring trailers and music and advertising. What was that experience yes. like? And it, did you ever feel restricted by the sort of formulaic quality of it and the sort of the lack of composing to a specific story all the time? Yeah, it can be it can be really difficult to get motivated to write that stuff. I mean, honestly, at the start of my career, the motivation was money. So it, that was like a little bit easier to like, hey, I need to get paid, so I need to do these tracks. Um, but you know by the time it gets round to track like 50 of the dubstep album which i i did like a lot of that back in 2012 uh when dubstep was a thing uh it's how do you reinvent the wheel again and make it sound interesting it's just it's it's really difficult but on the other hand once you get used to the structure because there is the structure for writing library music um once you get used to that, you can kind I don't want to say go on autopilot because you do need to be inspired to a point. But also at the same time, it's library music. And a lot of the time it's going to be behind something. You don't actually need it to uh, to have the attention grabbing thing uh, the whole way through. Um, see, one of the things I struggled with at the beginning with library music is I want to add like a tune on top of everything. Um, and a lot of the times library music were like, yeah, there's, there's too much melody. No, no, we don't like that. Um, and I'm like, really? Okay. Uh, well, the melody is like what sells this piece of music. So I'm going to have to rethink that. That was the biggest challenge for me. Um, so I generally succeeded with more of the sound designy, uh, electronic y trailers or the ones which did allow me to write a melody and like have a big cinematic build kind of thing i think i've i've got like six tracks on this album which is literally called cinematic builds for kpm um and uh yeah so so either it's either one or the other for me like either give me the really crazy like do anything electronic sound design weird stuff or let me write a tune and a build and i'm quite happy doing that all day long um but uh I mean, the, the other thing that is, is tricky about library music is the production value on some of the top libraries is absolutely insane. Um, and it's insane and some of these people are using samples only and I have no idea like how they're getting it to that level. I think there's, there's a lot of time spent on the mixing for sure. Um, and it, do, it, does sound, it does sound really incredible. And I think it became clear to me in about 2013, 2014, it was like, I'm either going to have to focus on one or the other. I think I could have like a really like long career in library music if I really put my mind to it, or I can do what I really enjoy, which is telling stories, but it might be, it might not be as uh, rewarding initially. Cause you know, you're, the chance to tell stories is entirely dependent on the project you get to work on. Now I got really, really lucky cause I got to work on Ori and I'm getting to work on Ori too. And those two projects alone are likely going to help me for a long time, assuming we don't screw up the second one. Um, but, uh, um, you know, not, not everyone has that kind of luck. Um, but so you, you do need a little bit of luck in getting the right project. That said, I think you make your own luck a little bit. Um, but, um, I think, for me, I, I, I dabble in library music now and then, like I should be doing it now because I'm in like a month or two or downtime. I really should be like cranking out a few tracks. Um, but getting from the mindset of like having a story to having no story is, is really tricky. Um, and some composers are absolutely, some of the li- best library music composers are absolutely brilliant at it. 
Um, I think Thomas Bergeson said he didn't want to do film music because he said it would be too limiting in terms of structure. Um, I, I do believe that is a quote that is like lurking around either VI control or some other forum. Um, but uh, because, because, you know, he gets to write music and structure in exactly the way he wants, which I totally understand. Um, and actually on the Will of the Wisps trailer we just did for Ori 2, um, I basically got to write the piece of music to the storyboards and they tweaked the length of the storyboards to the music. So I wasn't really writing to picture. They they tweaked the trailer to my music track so I could build the track as I wanted. And when it became clear that like the build was like five seconds too short, I'm like, can you guys extend this? Will you guys be able to extend this scene by like five seconds? Because it'll give me like an extra eight beats to really make the most of the building. Like, yeah, no problem. Um, so... I, I am finding like there's a bit more push pull now in especially in games especially with important cutscenes. Um, but library music you do have that total freedom. But for me the total freedom uh, scares me because <laughs> I like to have a little bit of structure defined by like the story that I'm working with. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that characterizes your music is the extraordinary use of the orchestra and making use of like each individual section. Uh, for example, like your your very subtle yet powerful use of the woodwind section in Ori. And I think the woodwinds are often a section that are looked over a lot yep. in modern music. So when was it that you really d learned how to write for orchestra? And what was that process like for you? Um, well, I, I got my crash course because going back to my time at the Royal Academy of Music, so the portfolio I wrote for them, the it was literally like five piano tracks and a string quartet. No orchestral stuff. And like trust me i looked at the other people who had applied um because i was like we were all like in the same room and i looked at their portfolios and i'm like there's no way i'm getting accepted because it was like full orchestra like beautifully notated all of that so i didn't know any of that i literally knew nothing um about writing for the orchestra um it's amazing i even wrote a string quartet to be honest um but anyway once i'd started um the orchestration teacher at the time he was like look just go into the practice rooms and ask a musician if they'll spend an hour with you to teach them about your instrument. Uh, because trust me, everyone's going to say yes. Um, because frankly, they don't want to practice. They just want to hang out. Or at least they're willing to take an hour out of their eight hours a day of practicing. Um, that's the good thing about the Royal Academy of Music is that there's literally geniuses around every corner. Um, and uh, that's basically what I did. Um, I, you know, I, I learned from really talented players um you know the limits of their instruments i mean you can get all of this stuff in a textbook but it's much more fun to do it with a real person um and they could like once they show you like physically what it, what you can and can't do with the instrument you just learn a lot more quickly and it's a lot more inspiring than looking at a textbook for hours and hours and hours um and this was before the age of YouTube. So like, you know, now you can just go on YouTube and you'll probably be able to find something like range of the flute. And there'll probably be like 20 videos, um, range of the flute. So really there's no excuse for anyone who's starting orchestrating today, like that they don't, to complain that they don't have the resources because they're everywhere. But like when I was at school, um, yeah, that's, that's what I did. I basically went through every instrument in the orchestra and it, it wasn't just one hour. I would like, you know, I, I, I try and do it, you know, every so often. And once I started writing for the instruments more, then I take the parts to the players. Is this playable? Is it not playable? Um, the only section of the orchestra I did have an understanding of was brass because I played the trumpet and trombone in school. Um, but uh, no, woodwinds, I didn't have a clue. Strings, I didn't have a clue. Uh, percussion is percussion, but there's things you can and can't do, like range of timpanies, for example. Like, you know, it's, it's always funny, like uh, you see some crazy timpani parts where it's like, seven different notes in like three seconds i'm like yeah unless unless you have seven timpani which could be doable uh but you generally speaking the limit's usually five um yeah it's it's just like lots of little things that you accumulate over time and it was a four-year course so um and they gave us lots of recording sessions there which you know you learn very quickly whenever you have a recording session about what works and what doesn't but you know that's the time to make a mistake make a mistake when you're in school no one's no one's gonna fire you while you make them like in school they're just gonna give you a give you a bad grade and you move on um but yeah that's that's how i got my understanding and then the rest of it is literally just experience um and not being afraid to like hire live musicians even when there's no budget like 
even if you can hire one person it just makes such a huge difference and i'm sure that's something you've heard many times before yeah so how early was it in ori when you decided that you were going to have that that color of the the solo voice how early was that uh the vocal um let's see it was actually honestly it was quite late uh, it was only actually a year before we finished the game um i knew i wanted voice but i didn't i i just hadn't found the right voice and i i didn't i didn't want to hire a session singer partially because i wanted someone that would fit into the vibe of the team and Ori's a, Ori 1 was a low budget game. I know everyone says that, oh, it was published by Microsoft. It must have had a lot of money. No, no, no. It really didn't. I can't go into like what the music budget was for Ori, but I can I can tell you right now that most people would be shocked at what the music budget was for Ori. Anyway, um, it's a low budget game and we're all like the studio was pretty desperate. It's full of people like the director, he left his amazing job at Blizzard, at Blizzard as a senior cinematic director to make this indie game um a lot of people had left big big jobs at like decent you know company safe jobs to make a game that they were passionate about so everyone was kind of like desperate for it to succeed so i was looking for a singer who was like just getting started and um i don't know how i found airily on youtube but i found airily on youtube um and then i reached out to her and then you know she lives in she lived in los angeles at the time i'm like oh okay well let's meet up and then the first piece of music we actually recorded was what we used for the launch trailer, not the announcement trailer, the launch trailer, which we did in uh, March 2015. I was like, okay, this is definitely going to work. Um, and then we did the announcement trailer, which had actually been written like six months prior to meeting Airly. But I'm like, wait, now I can put, instead of relying on the piano, now I can put a real voice on this opening like melody part. Um, and then after the reception for that trailer, I'm like, okay, well, we, we can use the voice for pretty much any significant non-gameplay moment. Because the thing, the thing about Aerolee's voice is it's so, uh, it, it demands your attention. And so whenever she's singing, like you're really paying attention to it. And like we tried it with, vo we tried her vocals with gameplay stuff. And it was, it was a little bit too it was like overpowering the gameplay because it's like something significant is happening because her vocal is here um so we chose not to do it we chose not to use it for the actual in-game sequences but um i think for almost every cutscene, um we're using her voice um and because our cutscenes are where we use to advance the story most of the time um and uh yeah it was just uh, it was the the right voice, the right time. Um, I mean, she's a big, she's a huge part of the sound of Ori. Like, um, it's it's not really the Ori soundtrack without her, and that that kind of tells its own story on the Spotify plays. Like, all of the tracks featuring her have by far the most Spotify plays. So, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's what makes yeah, the soundtrack uh, so nostalgic and memorable. Is that like the first hit in the soundtrack is just is her voice, and that's the first yep. thing that you hear. I think it's the last thing you hear as well um because it's it's literally it's yeah it's her it actually no it's it is just piano yeah it's piano and i think like humming at the uh, at the very end but uh um yeah it's um i don't know how we'll use her in the second game because we're still like it's still very early um but for sure um for sure airily will return um and uh it, it will really just depend on the story like how how we use her voice but uh yeah it ended up it ended up working even even better than i had envisioned for um for ori one absolutely so what was it like for you sort of being like the musical uh casting director for the project unspoken for which you had a few uh, individual <laughs> solo instrumentalists um well that was that was an interesting project because um they they had these three characters and they like we need them to have a unique identity but we want the score to be electronic and i'm like well that's that's that could be tricky and I'm, so then i made the suggestion was like well what if we had like one featured instrument for each for each character um and they were okay with that and i was like yes okay that's uh, that's good because you can do a lot with soloists um and then i'm like well let's look at what these characters do and what they sound like um so uh, the blackjack character is this like more mysterious, uh, mysterious magician character. So I chose to use 
Mimi Page, who has like super, super wispy and ethereal voice. Um, it's not, um, it's not quite as like deeply powerful as Aerolies, but it has its own unique angelic quality. Um, then I chose to use Bonnie Brooks Bank on electric violin and violin for the kineticist. That I wanted something. I wanted uh, the electric string sound, but I wanted it to be like fast and quick sounding, which is why I use the higher pitched string instrument. And then for the anarchist, it sounds totally predictable, but sometimes the most predictable answer is the best one. Um, I used Tina Guo on cello because it just it just was clearly the best solution. Um, I mean, like half of her videos represent anarchy anyway, so I was just like, let's just cast this properly. And uh, all the tracks that she played on do sound uh, do sound. They have they have the Tina sound, which is basically what was perfect for that character. Um, but working on that project, they kind of just gave me total freedom. Like we don't care as long as it fits the characters. So uh, um, yeah, Insomniac. Uh, the only the only real criteria is that they needed it to have like an electronic core. Um, so they needed it to be rooted in the synth world. But like once I suggest them, let's like. Let's get these three soloists and let, let's have some real drums so just to make it just to make it not so synthy and programmy um that'll really help like the, the the feel of everything um and you know we we just booked out uh east west studio two for for two days um and uh yeah it didn't really break the budget because it's only four it's only four players so uh we just had a great time uh, rocking out for for a weekend and uh the rest was all just uh, me doing synths and, and programming. Yeah, and it, I would assume you did a lot of like post production, like you created drones out of out of what you recorded and took your source audio. Yeah, and, and I mean, screwed with yeah, it a lot. I, and... uh, I mean, a lot of the a lot of a lot. It's a mix of pre production. I I think we did less on the post production because like a lot of it was already in the playing. Like the the switching of articulation from Tina, like one of Tina's signatures is switching from regular to sol ponticello back to regular, uh, then maybe to sol tasto. Like she's always moving moving where she's playing, um, and you kind of don't want to mess with that. Um, but in terms of delays and reverb and reverse reverb there are there are some things which we grabbed um i think maybe the most significant thing that we did though um on several of the tracks we put the electric sound on the right channel and the acoustic sound on the left channel whether they were playing the same or different um originally my plan was to use them separately but then uh i think like while i was listening to playback it was an accident they played both parts back at the same time and i was like oh that's actually pretty cool um let's let's do that um yeah i i tend to spend less time in post-production like messing things up because once i get to recording stage i'm kind of checked out of the composition process um so i try and do as much as possible like during the composition process um yeah once after recording i'm like ready to mix and get the thing shipped off um the only exception i would say was you know probably just recording voice on ori where i needed like the voice to like help sell the idea um so if it's a production thing that i need to like sell to the director then of course i'll like go all the way at the beginning um but in time but otherwise yeah post-production i'm like looking to get it done and get it finished um i i am not a tweaker or a or i don't fiddle about with stuff too much i just kind of like wanna i don't want i don't want to say wrap things up as quick as possible but i feel like if the concept is good and you stay true to it then and if you've executed the concept like how it is in your head um then what more can you do um then you just kind of have to put it into the world and see what the world thinks um but that's me like there are lots of tweakers who do really good stuff too um that's just everyone has a different approach right yeah 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 so we asked uh, the global composers network what they wanted to ask you and somebody asked uh, uh what's the difference between scoring for films versus video games and how do you find the overall aesthetic difference as well as the difference to your workflow um well films i find the time at least in my experience the timeline is ridiculously condensed um like you've got you've got a you know a month or two to come up with the concept come up with the instrumentation come up with the theme write all the music match it all to picture and if you're lucky enough to have an orchestra record it mix it see you later good night uh with games games unless you are very very lucky like me and you have full unfiltered access to the entire game build 
um, which on really big games like the ones that Ubisoft and Electronic Arts are making, you absolutely don't. Um, generally speaking, with games, you're writing to concept art and you're writing to ideas, so you're writing a little bit more conceptually. I think this is a, uh, I think this is a big problem in the game industry. By the way, that's like a whole. That I could spend a whole podcast just on that. Um, why, I think the the best games with the best soundtracks are the ones where the composer was like embedded into the process like really early on uh kind of like how hans does with christopher nolan like how early did he start working on interstellar i'm sure he started working on dunkirk really early too um and you know just i think the results especially in games where things are changing all the time um are just better but it's also you're not dealing with reshoots and re-edits in games um it's a lot you know it's not like you have to hire the whole production crew to like reshoot a scene in in a film with a game it's just you just move you can just move the camera around and it looks it can look like a completely different scene um that's how a lot of fixes are done so it's not it's not difficult to as as difficult to make changes in in a game um in terms of the process uh for games it can be the frustrating part is um is getting your stuff into the game and making sure it's playing back properly like one of the biggest parts of of ori that isn't really noticed by the player is that i tested the game like crazy now in a film you're going to sit down with the director and watch the film with the director several times and the director's going to tell you this part sucks this part's good this part sucks and then you're going to go back and do a version two and you're going to repeat it um you can't really do that with a game because games are really big who has eight to ten hours to you know play the game from start to finish every day but i personally believe especially in a narrative game like obviously in a racing game which usually doesn't have narrative it's completely different but i'm just going to speak on narrative games at the moment i think if you're doing a game which is telling a story you've got to play it from start to finish and if you can't do it then hire someone to play it like if you're not a good gamer then hire someone or if you're not a good gamer get the development team to make cheats for you so you can like skip to the section you want to play um which is what we did on ori like i could jump to any section of the game and test it out immediately um and get a feel for how the music flows see the mistake a lot of developers are making is you you'll, you'll get your spreadsheet and it's like level one music level two music three four five six seven and you you're like crossing off the list of tracks that you need to do and that's very satisfying and then you might test them in an isolated state but how do you know what the transition from level one to level two sounds like how does that feel to the like who's looking at the big picture like okay level one music sounds great but you need to think about an overall flow and arc and feeling in the game just like you would in a film like you know the, the, the you, you i think you know very early on when a film has good pacing because the highs feel really high and the lows feel really low like until recently a lot of the big blockbuster action films were just throwing visuals and like music at you all the time and when when everything is epic nothing is epic um but when you have like that dynamic ebb and flow like you feel more from it um but if you're not testing for that in the in the in the game you're 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 never you're never going to be able to like know what it's like for the player but that requires you also to get into the mindset of what a player might be feeling and it can be difficult to do that as a composer because you're you're so attached to the music um so that's where you know maybe it is a benefit to like hire someone else to play the game for you but i think that's one thing i can always tell when i'm playing a game i can always tell when the composer during the writing process played the game like you can just feel it because there is a unique synergy between the music and the gameplay uh, like the pace of the music and the gameplay that is fundamentally important like most of the tempos for the gameplay music in ori are between 100 and 125 beats per minute and there's there is there is a subtle reason for that it's it's to do with the speed of the footsteps and it's to do with the speed of the attacks and the speed of like um how quickly tra ori traverses the environment it's not just like i didn't just choose random tempos like there is a reason why all of the gameplay tracks are certain tempos there's a reason why all the boss tracks are 150 i think um and i think the final boss track is like 165 um you know it's it's subtle things like that like that can really like make a big difference to how a game feels and i think it's something that isn't really thought about because 
the amount of game music that has to be written as a composer is intimidating and you're just looking to get that massive long cue list finished but then you've got to test it and that's the part that like you're not really getting paid for um and i think maybe going forward some savvy agent needs to work out like music testing time into the contract because it's incredibly important and unless you have an amazing audio lead which an indie on every indie project you're not going to have an audio uh, at least someone like testing the audio for you um it's something that you're going to have to do um so it's something i would a anyone doing game music uh don't just write the music for the game please play it and test it there really is like an no excuse especially at the independent developer level for them not to be able to get you a build of the game that you can play yourself on your computer um like i said the only exception is with the really big stuff like with ubisoft and electronic arts the reason why they won't give you access is usually for security reasons they won't let stuff off site um but in that case why not ask them to fly out to ubisoft or sony or electronic arts and play the game there like oh no your life is so tough you have to spend a day at sony uh like that's that's like that that's what that's like how i would solve that problem uh but i haven't worked on a project for ubisoft ea or sony yet so um i haven't had that problem to deal with one of the nice things um working with moon studios is that even though they're a microsoft project microsoft have uh, they kind of like let us do what we need to do um so it's been nice like having the freedom i think i think i think I think when a lot of people, I, I think when a lot of these video game movies are being made, um, I think the difficulty is, is like, how do you remain faithful to the fans of the game, but also make a compelling movie experience? Um, and, you know, a lot of the Assassin's Creed games, you know, take 20 to 30 hours to finish. And so, like, how do you condense that kind of story into something that's two hours? Um, it's really difficult is the answer. Um, and... In terms of like the creative control aspect, um, I mean, on those kinds of projects, there are just so many moving parts that I also have no very little experience with. Maybe one day they'll make a movie, make an Ori movie, and then like I might have direct experience with it. Um, but like it's that that I can I can see you know th those are not small budget projects. I mean, the Assassin's Creed film was probably like at least like sixty million, if not more. Um, and already that like that's like 60 million dollars for a film is a, is like a medium budget film that's like a really high budget game um so like just you know with those kinds of projects like the really big projects of course the executives are probably going to take over um but you i i do i do wonder sometimes like um you know i've um i've I've met several executives from like the film or game world. And I, I do wonder sometimes like how many of them like actually play games from start to finish. Uh, you just, I mean, maybe they do, but like you, you don't really know. Like, and that's why I think it's really important. Like if you're, if you're, if you're on the development side, if you have the fortune to be working on a game, I think it's incredibly important to be actually playing it. Um, don't just don't, don't take your composer title and think of it. You're just a composer because you, you're, you're you are responsible for how the the game plays back your music too gotcha okay so ubisoft has just hired gareth coker for the next assassin's <laughs> creed game what is going to be your first step in taming the beast that is like 20 hour gameplay wow you put me on the spot there um I guess the first thing I would ask them is like, uh, do they want me to use the original like Assassin's Creed theme, um, which is like which constantly comes up. Um, like some composers have used it, some composers haven't, because um, it's not been Jesper Kidd uh, for some time now. Um, I, that's the first thing I would cover because like, am I going to need to do a theme or not? Basically, because if they, you know, honestly, it's a really good theme, the original one, um, and. Uh, I think it's the one that they ha that has been reused. So first is like establishing themes. Then obviously I need to find out like the location, like and if there's any like, like what world music research do I need to do depending on where it's set. Like I think the newest one is set in Egypt. Uh, how how Middle Eastern would they want the score to sound, for example? Like I think Sarah Schachner is doing the score for the new one, um, and I'm sure she's asked similar questions. Um, and then really it's um 
usually in the Assassin's Creed games, there's usually a bunch of core locations, um, and they usually tend to have unique ambient music per location, if my memory serves me correctly, and unique battle music per location. Um, one thing I've noticed about the Assassin's Creed music is that the transitions are not actually fantastic between ambient and battle music. Battle music. Often at times it's just fade in, fade out, and you can actually like audibly hear the fade in, fade out. This is another thing, by the way, that I, I absolutely love, because most gamers really don't care about how seamless the music is. Um, all they care about is does the battle music play at the right time and as long as it's within like two to three seconds you're probably good um, but uh, yeah otherwise in terms of scope my approach with scope has been to do what is required and usually usually I would love to have unique music for almost every cutscene or at least every major cutscene um, and then like enough so that the ambient and battle music doesn't get repetitive. Um, Ori is a 10 hour game for most people uh, and it has 135 minutes of music. Um, and that's about right. Um, see the reason why Ori works in terms of like dealing with the repetition thing is because you're never in the same area for, or you're never hearing the same music cue for like longer than 10 minutes unless you're getting stuck. Um, and if you're getting stuck, well, tough. You're going to hear the same music cue. Um, but I didn't really do... I didn't really... Do, well, no, we didn't do anything. Like, all of Ori's music is just stereo tracks playing on loop. Like, there's no there's no fancy implementation. Now, what I did do in Ori is think very, very, very hard about, like, when the music changes from one location to another location. Um, and the cool thing is, like, I get to very easily define, like, each location in the game which has unique music. Um... But uh, yeah, if you get stuck, you're going to hear the same cue. But that, that's there's, what are you going to do otherwise? Like, are you going to randomly change the music while you're stuck? Like, what could be more annoying to the player? Like, let's have a piece of music that tells the player that they're stuck. Or let's just go silent. Then if you go silent, then yeah, you're hearing the ambience. But who wants to be in silence for, for like an hour? Not many people. And then if you go into silence, well, when do you bring the music back in? Like... Do you bring it back in when they solve the puzzle? That's the most obvious thing to do. But most people in a game like Ori, and every game is different, they they kind of want something in the background, especially when there's no dialogue, you know? Like, you need to have something. Um, so that said, most of the gameplay music in Ori is fairly inobtrusive. Um, it's not like stabbing you in the face the whole time. Um, so um if the music was louder i would definitely like think about like when to take it out if a player gets stuck but for example like the the crazy water chase sequence the music's just a loop there and it's full on like it's full orchestral music and when you die it just starts again um and i did wonder about that like is this going to be too repetitive and i'm just like well this feels like a good piece of music to me let's just see what happens and see if you know if we get the feedback that's too repetitive i'll just have to learn from it and suck it up and move on but the feedback was the music inspired me to keep on going when i died and i'm like well that's i could i the only way i figured that out is because i played it and if it feels good to me then I trust myself to put it in the game. If it doesn't feel good to me, then I'm never going to put it in the game. That's why, you know, but you can't figure that out until you've tested it. I think it was um, Ellie Goldenthal and Trevor Revin who said that exact same thing in the, in the score of film music documentary. They said the exact same thing. Like if it, or no, it was Junkie XL and Ellie Goldenthal. Yep. Um, they said like, no, Junkie XL and Trevor Rabin, they said like, if the music does not give them goosebumps, they cannot expect the audience to feel those goosebumps um yeah so that's that's always my approach like if, if i'm not feeling anything then it doesn't it doesn't get if i'm not feeling anything i don't even show it to the developers or the director like let alone let alone the audience um so um yeah that's 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 my that's my approach like i test it before it even before anyone else even hears it um so but yeah that's that's just my approach so now just for a couple of techie stuff, just for the composers that are out there yeah, go for and it. that I, are watching this. I, these always come up and it's a composer group, so it's okay. I've done a lot of panels where it's like, where it's just fans. And like when fans are like asking technical questions, I'm like, come on, man. Like there's a bunch of people here who aren't composers. But because it's a composers group, I'm happy to answer all the tech questions ever. So go for it. Sounds so good. So I, I would assume the first thing that people are interested in knowing is what DAW do you use and why? <laughs> and have you always bet on that DAW? 
see this is this is a, this is a fun one because like i use one of the the least popular ones um and i always i always like to play like guess which door i use but um i use i use sonar platinum so i'm pc bound and i'm so uh, i'm using sonar which is an incredibly rare combination now the reason i've been using them is because they were the first to go 64 bit uh they were actually the first sequencer to go 64 bit and i saw 64 bit before everyone else like did and uh, if you're a mac user you know that mac was quite late to the party especially if you're a logic user uh, mac was very late to the party on getting everything 64-bit so sonar at the time when i started using it which was 2008 um it its interface was awful um its handling of audio was pretty bad its handling of video was really bad so if you're working in film just not not going to happen um, but I wasn't really working in film at the time. The most I was doing was working in trailers so I could survive. Um, but what they did have is amazing. Sonos always had great MIDI, uh, like MIDI editing and all of that, which is pretty essential for our job. Um, and it was first to go 64 bit and that had amazing benefits, which like, uh, which meant I've been working on one computer for a very long time. I hate the whole slave setup. Um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm all self-contained. Like I, I, my computer's powerful enough that I can run everything I run everything I need within Sonar and its its environment. The loading times are occasionally a bit long, but that's been helped by solid state drives. So even that is like a non-issue now. Um, uh, one other thing that your audience might be interested in is I. I hate templates. The only time when a template makes sense is like after I've established the overall theme for a project. For example, uh, the Minecraft Chinese mythology project. It was pretty clear I was going to have a consistent set of instruments for the whole thing. And I was like, we had a live orchestra at the end of it. So like, I kind of knew what I was writing for. So yes, then I'd make like, a, but not not like a 300 track template, like uh, maybe two, two or three contact instances and that's it. Um, but no, generally speaking, uh, I don't use templates because I don't like being limited to a certain sound set. And that includes orchestral samples. I think different orchestral samples have different purposes. Yeah. So I know that a lot of TV composers will like to actually build their template over like a season, for example. Like they'll use a specific yep. set of sounds. Next episode, they'll take those sounds and then they'll add to that. And then by the end of the season, yep. they have a really hardcore template that they can then yep. carry over into the second season. Do you tend yep. to, to, to build like that on occasion? Yeah, I think um, I think with so with arc it was generally mostly orchestral the whole way through so that was actually kind of easy like once i'd once i'd found the sound for the mock-up like that transferred to all of the other tracks um like what sound works in game like what orchestral samples work in game uh and also percussion as well like getting getting that right um uh, with ori ori is very unique like each area has an incredibly unique palette um because Ori's regarded as an orchestral score, but if you listen carefully, it's really not. It's it's a hybrid score, um, and there's a lot of stuff going on behind the orchestra. Um, and yeah, I would say each major area in the game has a unique palette. Uh, the only thing that's transferring across is like, oh, which muted strings patch am I going to use this time? Uh, the awesome one from Spitfire or the awesome one from Symphobia? Um, like um but other than that like there wasn't really much much that was transferring across but that said the tv approach um i think for a lot of projects would work really well um like because you do start to have favorite sounds um within within projects but my the way i write scores is so is so texture based anyway at least from the starting point it starts with the texture and then the and and like and instrument choices and then like the melodies come after that um but starting with the textures like it means i i never really have a consistent template but that's part of my process and it doesn't really slow me down anymore because i get really inspired by like finding new sounds and once i found like what i think is the right combination and right palette i can write incredibly quickly like once the palette is there i'll i'll write super fast because it's not like I'm not writing while I'm designing the palette. I'm usually just noodling around like, and you know, noodling around on cool sounds is really fun for me. Um, so that noodling around process is part of the, like filtering through all the trash that you write in order to find the good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So do you tend to write free a lot or are you usually writing to tempo? 
Oh, I'm always writing to tempo. Um, I think the only, I think if I got a real piano in the house, I would, but we don't really have room. Uh, but then I would start like doing more of my sketches on that because I'm still a pretty good piano player. I mean, I've been playing since I was eight. I don't obviously don't practice anymore, but I'm obviously playing every day because of the composing. Um, but you know, you you play and practice six hours a day for ten years. You don't you don't really lose that. Um, so um, if we had a real piano in the house, then I would do a lot more on the real piano because that for me is like a super inspiring instrument to play and i i i, I actually think i should probably do it sooner rather than later because i feel like my compositions might improve i'm more adventurous on a real piano for whatever reason i can't really explain it there's just this real weird psychological thing like i feel very uninspired when i'm looking at a midi controller <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's not really as satisfying as like hearing those strings resonate um you know i've got you know i've got really good piano sample libraries but it's just not the same when you don't when you're not like physically like hearing the the strings vibrate um but yeah i i tend to write in i tend to write and sketch all in the sequencer and i do it all to tempo um yeah i don't really doing the free time thing scares me because then it has to be fixed um and that's just like a whole uh thing i don't really want to do <laughs> yeah so that 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 is the thing because i know a lot of composers will will like to act even though they're you know daw sequencers and they write the whole scores in the sequencer sometimes they like to get away from that and they like to sketch all of their ideas you know handwritten like for example harry yep. Gregs williams does it yep. uh but he, he scores everything in a sequencer uh but then again you have composers like han zimmer who's known to have the whole musical diary idea and he, yep. he you know writes his um sketches in the sequencer so what do you think is that aesthetic difference like what what do you think that really encompasses i think um when you're doing pencil and paper like i think it's good to get away from the computer for a while um and yeah i do try and do that even if it's just like doing something in my head like i can walk around the house and just do something in my head for a while um but uh I th yeah i think with pencil and paper once you're separating from yourself from the computer you're you're like relying on a certain part of your brain more whereas when you're at the computer like you're you're really relying on the the creative side of your brain a little less i think like i think i think pencil and paper forces you to think a little bit more um and it's also just more physical um i think when you're engaging your entire body physically into something that can that can like help um help with the writing process but you know most of the time we're sat hopefully in a good quality chair <laughs> at a desk all day and looking at a screen all day and that is not particularly healthy um and i think like even just getting up and walking around um see my big thing is doing exercise like i since i started exercising my productivity has gone through the roof um for for like several years i didn't do anything and then last year i started um doing three times a week and uh i feel like a million times better and i can work for long it's not actually it's not actually i can work for longer i work more efficiently um and sometimes when you're stuck in front of the screen all day like you feel like you're working but you're not actually getting much done um and i think that's where like changing the process or doing something physical even if it's just as simple as getting up and doing something with pencil and paper even if you don't know how to write for, for pencil and paper just like get up and like uh start like humming a tune or something or like uh singing what's in your head um that can make a huge difference to the mindset but yeah if you're if you're like stuck at the screen all day I mean, you can. I think you can do it when the deadline's on and when, when like the pressure's on. Then, of course, like adrenaline can carry you through a lot of things. But what do you do when the adrenaline isn't there? That's like when it's really hard. Um, so that's the pencil and paper. Even though I'm classically trained, the pencil and paper is now second for me, um, just because we're in, we're in the modern world now. It's just like it's it's just the way things are. Like I I, I do sometimes sketch on pencil and paper. But at the end of the day, like, I'm still, like, my ideas are written on my MIDI controller, so I might as well record them, you know? Um, now, I think I would use, if I had the real piano, I would definitely use pencil and paper more, for sure. But then again, maybe not. Maybe I would just get a real piano that recorded directly to MIDI, because those exist, right? Like, <laughs> so, like, or, 
or I would just, uh, you know, take a, a, a recorder, uh, like an audio recorder and just record everything for an hour. Like, who kn- I, I don't know what I would do yet, but like, I do feel like my approach would improve if I had a real instrument. That's for sure. So um, one question I know a lot of people will have for you is yes. when there is so much music to write and there's, there's, there's such a demand and uh, maybe one day you, the tap just goes off and you're just <laughs> contemplating, you know, idea and you have no idea where you're going at that point. So how do you escape writer's block? And are there any things that you you'd normally go to to defeat writer's block? Okay, well, the first thing I do is to not try and fight it, um, which I know seems like crazy, especially if you have a deadline. Um, but I've I've generally found, and uh, I don't want to set a precedent here because the imp- most important thing in any like client-employee relationship is communication. But like, if you communicate with your client that you're struggling or you need an extra day, they're generally almost all deadlines are like slightly movable in the entertainment industry especially um now of course if you're getting started that can be quite intimidating to do if you've got like a body of work which like proves that you can get it done then it's a lot easier to make that request um but yeah it does happen from time to time and when i recognize that it's happening or sometimes i'm just tired you know like and i'm just like screw it i'm not going to write anything now um i'll just stop and I'll do something completely different. I'll I'll go, I'll go watch a film. I'll go play a game. The most important thing for me is to get out of this room because uh, this is obviously where I spend the vast majority of my time. Uh, I have a nice living room, huge television. Uh, I live in a nice neighborhood. I you know go out for a walk, um, or or j- literally just do anything else like that makes me forget about what a terrible time I just had composing. Um, and sometimes that can be just taking a nap, you know, like it can be as simple as that. But I think the longer you spend trying to fight the writer's block, at least in my experience, uh, then the worse it makes you feel. And the word that if, the, if it makes you feel bad, then it's going to be harder for you to get out of that malaise. If you can like recognize early in the process, like, oh boy, it's going to be a struggle. Uh, I don't think it's worth fighting this. Then just cancel it completely uh it's i find it's usually easier to get out of the rut um now in the situations where you have no choice where you've got to finish something well then you just got to rely on technique and hopefully you've written enough music in your career that you that you know something that's worked and you can go back to it and like well this idea worked there maybe it'll work here it can be as simple as like hey that chord sequence worked there what if i wrote a different melody over that chord sequence um oh that texture worked in this track that i did two years ago what if what if that what if that works here um if you keep your past music well organized which most composers should do uh, then it can be easy to find this old stuff to get inspired and like just use stuff that you've done in the past to get you over the finishing line because at the end of the day if you do have a hard deadline you've got to get it done like you've just got to find a way to get it done and that's when you rely on technique and past experience um And that is where also where education can help a lot too. Like there are times when I've been struggling and it's like, okay, let's get out the textbook. Like, let's see, like, you know, I mean, some of the textbooks, they literally have hundreds and hundreds of chord sequences like written out for you, ready to go. Like, you know, use one of them. Like if it gets you over the finishing line, it's just a chord sequence at the end of the day. Like there's, there's thousands of them. Um, uh sometimes the textbook can remind you of things that have forgotten like you know melody using retrograde write the melody in reverse like you know when was the last time anyone wrote a counter melody like that's like you know because counter melody is a lost art like and it can be can be an easy way to make something sound interesting like just i've got dozens of textbooks that i barely refer to anymore because i know them inside out but occasionally you, you know you forget stuff um and it can just be inspiring to pick up that book um and like read through some other stuff um that 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 you forgot or just remind remind you of things that you already know but like you're looking you're looking at looking at it on a piece of paper and it can help like it can sometimes help trigger something um but yeah generally speaking relying on technique and past experience um can get you over the finishing line when you need to when you've got to get something done 
And I would assume it's just one of those things where it just quite literally does not hurt to, to know it. You know, you, there's a lot of people nowadays who, who go around just smashing music theory. Oh, I don't need it, whatever, you know, it's crap. Until they get to a point to where they can't think of anything. And then it would be nice to know that, oh, if I want something Irishy, oh, that, I can just use a Dorian scale because it has that, right. nat, uh, right. you know, the natural sixth. Or, you know, that, that type of stuff. You know what I mean? It's just, well, I, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, that's I mean, overlooked. You've just reminded me of a page in like one of my books, which was like literally my professor wrote like, so it's only available to the students like who take his course. And there's literally one page where it lists all the modes and then the emotional qualities that those modes have, like a bunch of adjectives. I'm like, well, this is a gold mine. Just this, just this one page here is a gold mine. It's just, it's just stuff that you can forget about. Um, and I mean, yeah, like the, the debate on music theory, like, look, you can have an amazing career without music theory. Of that, there is no doubt. But I think there's a quote by Danny Elfman. Like, he said, like, if he had time to do a music education, he would absolutely do a music education. Like, um, but I think there was some article that, like, slammed him for, like, not being an educated music composer. And it's like, at the end of the day, who cares? Um, he, like, he writes great music. Um, and, that, like, he wrote a response. And he's like, look, I'm not knocking music education. Like, I would get one if I could. Um, and I have no doubt that it would be valuable to me. But it's also, at the end of the day, music is music. And it's as much about the theory as, a, as like, what's in here. Um, that said, I don't, I don't think... I don't think you can knock music theory just because, like, you, literally, you can learn. You you if you're going from no music theory to even like knowing what a basic scale is, you've improved your musical knowledge. Um, one of my pet things, like I've I've had a couple of composition students I generally don't teach, but there was a there are a couple who I've had, um, and honestly, like one of the most basic things that is overlooked. How much music do we hear in root position? like so much music in root position and i'm guilty of it too we're all i think we're all anyone working in film and games is guilty of it because root position is powerful um but you can make your music a million times more interesting just change that bass note just change it from the root position to the first inversion and you've instantly got something like way more compelling and interesting even if you only do it for one chord um like it's amazing the difference like that changing changing the bass note of the chord makes um and it's so simple but i think a lot of composers are using their right hand to write the melody and their left hand to do the bass note because they're all writing on keyboard and not every composer is great on the keyboard um so they are <laughs> forgive the pun they are rooted in root position um and they're afraid to like they're afraid to like go beyond root position and just like adventure out but like honestly once you go beyond root position you've opened up like literally like 90 percent of the vocabulary like you could ever need like if you're just willing to like and you will advance your music so much by going beyond that damn root position which is don't get me wrong it's really hard to get out of and it's fun writing music in root position because it's because it's usually action stuff and it's all trailery stuff um but like your music sounds way more interesting if you choose the right time to like get get away from using the root position chords you are you are entering a gold mine and a treasure chest and like all and the the pot at the end of the rainbow it's like all of those things and your music will take a giant leap forward now the, the the scary thing is about because you've got so many options once you move away from the root position is like how do you get back to the root position like and that's just something you can only learn with with time but like okay um any any composer like who is not confident on the piano like just play chords and like move to a different chord and just change the root and understand like what like makes gives that chord its quality like um that's like the the, the the two the two pet things for me are like the root position first inversion second inversion thing and then the voice leading like once you've learned those two things you can literally write almost anything in my opinion at least in the film and game world like obviously there are exceptions like you can't write a horror score like with the with the orchestral effects but like in terms of the harmonic vocabulary like learn voice leading and learn the different positions for the bass note in the chord and you you will have you will you will solve a lot of problems and that comes back to the writer's block thing by the way like get out of root position i guarantee you that will solve like a big part of your writer's block 
I think it was at like one point I was studying like an Elgar score, and he, he does he's this most amazing thing. He's like he uses inversions all the way up until he wants like the most impactful moment, and then he'll yep. just like smack the viewer in the face with the root, you know, inversion. And it's just like it's so much more heartwarming. Like even like in Nimrod, you know, it's like it's yep. such an yep. impactful yep. emotional yep. piece. And sometimes you're like, what is that chord? Because it doesn't exactly sound like the root position, but it but it has the same notes. But the way for which the emotional you know changes from from that root position is just amazing. So I. Definitely definitely agree well you can't it's much harder to build tension when you're when you're uh when you're using root position because you're always so grounded but like once you once you and music is all about tension and release we i think every composer knows that but like so you want to like help yourself build tension well get away from the root that's like um that's like one of the easiest ways easiest ways to do it um and uh yeah that's uh it, it, it can really help writer's block too like because uh, often i i find myself like writing to root position a lot too just because it's in the film vocabulary so much these days and it's like wait no just come on use your brain just a little bit like move that left hand like lift pick it up and put it somewhere else because it'll probably sound good um and hey presto there you've you've like found the next chord absolutely so what are yeah, what we literally are, spent yeah. like 10 minutes on root position i know <laughs> yeah yeah so i think we just have time for a couple more questions so this the second to last question is okay. what sample libraries do you commonly find yourself using and do you make your own um so i i i don't make my own i hire others to do the recordings for me and based on so i would say i produce my own that's but like in terms of the actual act now nah, I'm, I'm just too lazy uh it's and it's all no it's not lazy it's just like there are people who can do the recordings better than me um and i'd rather just give them a creative concept and have them run with it um so yeah i don't make my own uh it's also just very labor intensive like and doing all that stuff in contact is literally my worst nightmare um so it's just not something i'm into um but uh no in terms of creating sounds for me that's something i'm thankfully now in a position to do a little bit more than i was in the past so that's pretty cool um in terms of my go-to sample libraries uh i own the entire spitfire collection uh i think they're incredible uh one of the things i love about spitfire is that their um their orchestral interfaces um aren't obnoxiously large i don't i don't like composing in contact if you get what i'm saying um i like to load my instrument and then forget that contact even exists um like i'll set up my mic positions but i'm usually loading up the the ct and the o mics and in spitfire anyway and then i'm just forgetting about it um uh so yeah spitfire is the bulk of my orchestral template uh i us i usually go to berlin woodwinds for uh for the woodwindy stuff um especially the solo stuff is unbelievable um uh for brass it's kind of all over the map it really depends on the the type of sound i want because i find that the brass sounds from library to library are really really different um like spitfire has some really good stuff but so does cinebrass uh the only one i don't have yet is berlin brass but it sounds pretty good to me um um but the symphobia brass is a really nice sound if you want like that low warm like accompanying soft brass chord sound which you need a lot in film music um i i'm a big fan of ensemble libraries because they save a lot of time and they make your mock-up sound good um i don't care that like that if, if they're not like super realistic it's about like the performance um yeah project sam uh spitfire uh with a with a dose of uh, the cine sample stuff and the berlin berlin stuff um and then sometimes it's about like a certain sound i want like occasionally i'll go, go back to the 8do stuff or the 8w stuff like some of those like amazing swells can really just add like it even though it's like a what is it a 200 piece string section in the 8w thing like it's it's completely ludicrous but it has a certain sound quality that is very unique um and can add something to a production um but uh yeah the go-to's for orchestral stuff for uh, spitfire project sam and, and berlin uh berlin um but I, i'm probably gonna i'm probably gonna invest in the brass pretty soon because i've heard too many good things uh percussion all over the map i think i literally have every percussion library ever um because there's th they're all recorded slightly differently so they all have like a slightly different tone quality um 
and then you know it's funny like th the logical follow-up question would be like how do you know what the right sound is to use because that's one thing that my conductor alex always asks me is like how do you know like your your mock-ups are usually pretty good like how do you know how to find the right sound i'm like i spend a lot of time getting to learn my sample libraries i think one of the mistakes a lot of beginner composers make is expecting sample libraries to solve all of their compositional problems uh if only it was that simple um and I think it's really important to write to the strengths of your libraries. Like some libraries are just better at doing the legato thing. Some libraries are just better at doing the sustain thing. You've got to get to you've got to get to know your libraries and what they're good at and what they're not good at. And unfortunately, you'll spend a lot of money in that process, and you'll probably buy some stuff that you're incredibly satisfied with. That said, I think with almost any orchestral library, you can get a good sound out of it if you're willing to invest the time. It can it can even be like the cheapest one because um, at the end of the day it and it, as it comes back to what i said earlier it's not about the realism that is going to like sell your music it's about the feeling and if you can program feeling into the the crappiest sample it's not going to matter how bad the sample was all that the person listening is going to remember is that they felt something when listening to your music and I've heard both ends of the spectrum. I've heard people hear like uh, I've heard people do mock-ups with what is perceived as a, a, a poor sample library, um, and I've seen people like emote from them. Um, heck, we can go back to the Final Fantasy VII games, which was done entirely in MIDI, and people emoted from the music in that. So like that's just a perfect example. On the other end of the scale. I've heard people do terrible mock-ups with Symphobia, which is regarded as like one of the best libraries like ever made, and people are still using it. Like, so at the end of the day, it comes down not just to the sample quality, it's like how you're using it, how you're programming it, how you're using it, and of course, how you're composing and arranging with it. At the end of the day, a bad arrangement with the best samples is still going to be a bad arrangement. <laughs> so, you know, they, these things all kind of go hand in hand. Um, like yes get good sample libraries but also you know keep up your orchestration chops unfortunately in this day and age you've got like a million skills as a composer to keep up with and that's before you even start with the problem of how do you get work <laughs> yeah definitely so, so what about synths and uh, do you program any your own do you use zebra or you know what kind of synths do you use again like this is one of those things like now because i'm in a position where i have the luxury of having a budget to do these things i'm able to hire other people to do custom synth sets for me um i'm about to hire the unfinished for ori 2 uh, which is going to be fun and a couple of other people a couple of other people are going to be doing some stuff synth stuff for me uh, for ori 2 there's a lot of pulses in ori 2 but like not the not the you know the 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 zebra like uh synthy pulses um it, it it's just usually a lot of uh, bell ostinatos for example like a lot of uh metallic -y sounding like things that just kind of tick away in the background because uh, it is a platformer and you're constantly moving so it's like it's it's that kind of like organic pulses is what i'm like looking for um i do tend i i'm i do tend to enjoy like tweaking presets like i i spend a lot of time in omnisphere too but i'd never use the core sound library anymore because it's like it's everywhere there's so many third-party sound libraries for omnisphere not just the unfinished but like there's like literally like i think i have like about 80 and in, in, and i'm sure yes um and they're all fantastic because they're all using like um they're all using like original material because now that you can import original material into omnisphere too it's uh it's like it's just the best instrument ever um and because some of these libraries are less known that means they're lesser used and like they're not like you don't hear like the certain sounds like that are like everywhere across the film and tv thing like i, th I think there's one sound from omnisphere one like um uh it's owed to mr newman and it's like the one of the most used like patches i think ever um it's this really cool arpeggiated thing and it does have a really cool sound quality but i've heard it in so many things now in, and in some really big productions too um uh, and and hey it's a good sound so so whatever um and you know composers are in a rush sometimes and you're going to go to the sound that that works but um i think i think um with synth stuff yeah, I'm using Omnisphere, Zebra. I, I love all the UHE stuff. Um, give me a sec. I'm gonna load up. I'm gonna load up my uh, thing and tell you exactly what I have because I can't even remember. 
because um, I have quite a few. Um, okay. And here we go. Sets. Um, oh, I just got uh, a few months ago, I got Keyscape, which I know technically isn't a synth, but oh my god, the sounds in that are incredible. And now that you can put Keyscape into Omnisphere, oh my goodness, it's so much fun. Um, yeah, there's nothing too like crazy here. Um, uh, I guess I use a lot, there's a lot of people programming synth stuff in contact as well. Um, uh, one of my favorite uh, synths for the really aggressive stuff, and I used it a lot in the Unspoken, is the uh, the Olga synth. Have you heard of that one? It's like a distort. It's really like a synthesizer for distortion, but all the controls are in Russian, so you can't really understand them, uh, which makes it great for experimenting. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I've I've had that for a while. Um, any other weird toys here? No, it's really. Um, it's really just like the custom stuff for, for Omnisphere 2 now. I think that's that's probably the direction I'm going to take just because I just like, I like all the effects within Omnisphere 2. Like there's just so much you can do. It's funny, I was talking to you how I don't like composing in contact. I love composing in Omnisphere. Like I love fiddling around in there. Like, cause the interface is amazing. Um, I would do it more in Zebra, but like Zebra is just like, everything's too small even with the like you can enlarge the interface it's just something that just like hurts my eyesight with uh with zebra um but uh yeah i i like fiddling around in atmosphere oh uh the other one uh which isn't even available anymore unless you're a logic owner uh is alchemy um which was originally by camel audio but then apple bought them much to my annoyance uh because i think they're an incredible company um but yeah, uh, Alchemy um, has some really, really cool stuff in their stock library. It's an inc it's it's really great because it has like this. Uh, it's kind of like an X Y axis thing, um, but you can like blend like with the X Y axis between like eight different variations of the same sound in real time. So you can get like these really cool performances just by like moving an X Y axis. It's it's unbelievable. Um, but Alchemy also has amazing third-party sound sets uh, by um, Simon Stockhausen, who is related to Karl Heinz Stockhausen. Um, but he runs a site called Patchpool.de, and uh, I all of the Alchemy sound sets are unbelievable. And it has it has one of the best solo violins I've ever heard. Even though it's only made up of four recordings, it is just this most perfect searing sound um, that I layer on quite a lot of things it's all over the ori soundtrack um even though we recorded a real string section i still left it in there because it has this unique searing quality and i will probably use it in ori too um but yeah alchemy it's now not available unless you use logic so tough for anyone who wants to get it um so if you really want to use alchemy you just have to get logic uh those people who do use logic you're very lucky and I'm jealous because that new version that is in Logic looks absolutely glorious. Um, but I will just have to suffer with, I think the last version I had was like 2014. That's the, but it's still, it's in 64 bits. So it's future proof and it will be a part of my uh, my setup forever. Cause that's the sequence, I, that, sorry, that's the synth I go to for when I need to do weird stuff um, or the violin sound. It's weird stuff or the violin sound. <laughs> Okay, so here's the last question, yes. uh, and it's a, it's a pretty commonly asked question. Um, so what is your advice to a composer entering the realm of video game, film, music for media, um, composition, and also to the people that are just entering the realm of getting paid for gigs and you know how there's so much going around now and people are still asking for unpaid composers, but composers need to make money. So how, how, do, you, how do you get through that, and how do you get yourself um, you know, going into the – um, composing world well I mean I guess the best advice is to tell people what happened to me so um, uh, and I'm I've been quite open about this especially recently because I'm a bit more established now so um, after USC I was I was an assistant I, I mean actually I did three assistantships during USC and one just after and basically to cut a long story short I was a terrible assistant and I was bad I like I had the, I probably had the wrong attitude and uh, I, I just didn't do a very good job of that. Okay, so first thing, if you're young enough and you're doing the assistant thing, 
have a really amazing attitude and say yes to everything like even if you don't know how to do it um, because that's what google is for and that's what youtube is for and that's what your friends are for and probably your colleagues are too um, so if you do the assistant thing which will be a direction for a lot of people uh, make sure you have a positive attitude a better attitude than i did um, so with that uh, after i did the assistant thing and then stopped doing the assistant thing uh, well, I graduated USC and I didn't really have any context, so I kind of had nothing and I had like five to six months of doing nothing and then I almost went broke. So what am I going to do? Um, so first things first, I just started getting online and like, you know, I, I this sounds like such a cliche, but I literally typed into Google how to make money as an independent musician. I know this sounds like such a cliche thing, but it started providing me it's not really the action of typing it into google it got me into the mindset of looking for work and you like if you want to if you actually are serious about getting work like and you you get into the mindset like it's amazing what changes um it sounds like this really like hippy dippy uh um flower power thing of like if you think about it it will happen but actually like changing your mindset and getting into the mindset of like oh my God, I need work, can, can actually, is like the first step. But then of course you've got to like follow through. Um, so what I did, uh, I was like, okay, well first I need to earn money. And uh, that was when I joined uh, the royalty free music website, Audio Jungle. Um, and so I uploaded almost all of my student stuff that I'd ever done, which was quite a lot of work. Um, and at the time, Audio Jungle wasn't what it is today, which is a really, really big marketplace with a saturation of tracks for sure um but uh i got on at the right time and i i was still doing like i was doing the trailer thing but it wasn't really enough to support like living in los angeles um but i had enough like trailery tracks that like were well produced i i had reasonable production values in 2010 um so they stood out on audio jungle which at the time there were not many like prominent users on audio jungle um so I had this like set of tracks which I just called Epic Drums of Doom and it's like a set of five literally p trailery drum tracks and they sold like hotcakes and that like took care of rent for like a couple of months. Um, so I was like, okay, well now I can like breathe. Um, and also in that time frame, uh, I, was doing, I was doing trailers like here and there, but it wasn't really enough. Um, but also in that time frame, I was... Uh, putting my music onto a bunch of different websites like literally every website i could find like video game website like film music websites um, and just setting up a profile with a link to probably not soundcloud at the time because i'm not sure soundcloud even existed but may maybe it did um but uh just getting my music out there and that's one of the things you absolutely have to do like get your music out there and try and direct people to it it's not enough to create a twitter account because like who's following you no one it's not enough to create a YouTube page because you've got to get followers. You've got to like actually get out there and like interact with people um, to get them to follow you. Um, anyway, I made a bunch of these profiles, a bunch of forum posting. And then one day on uh, on this website called moddb.com, which is a small-ish website where uh, developers go to make mods for video games, which are just like add-ons that people are making in their spare time. And I contributed to a couple of things for free. And I had started doing this like when I was a student, but I hadn't really taken my profile page very seriously. So I put that together. And then quite quickly, um, I got contacted by a guy who needed music for his dinosaur game. Now, he didn't pay me anything up front, but he offered me back end and quite significant back end. Um, and I was like, OK, well, this this works. Um, um, and the game eventually came out in 2012 and I am still receiving checks from that game in 2017 just to give you an idea like and they're not big checks but they're still checks um, and, and interestingly game, enough your biggest project to date now is a dinosaur game right right that's well that's that's here so here's the funny thing about that right because this is how things start so that game I did for free primal carnage um, led to several things so it led to my profile on mod db now here's the first thing that my first other thing that my mod db profile led to the director of ori contacted me through mod db and at the time it wasn't called ori he said i've got this prototype game 
that needs music and i'm going to pitch it to various publishers i've been following your work and i think your stuff's kind of good and maybe you'll be a good fit for this game if you score the prototype for free uh and we get a successful pitch for the game you can do the music for the game so i played the prototype and i was like hey this game looks pretty cool uh, I guess I'll do the prototype for free and I'm kind of desperate anyway. I can't afford to say no, so I might as well. Um, and then six months later, I had the Ori gig. So this is just a result of like doing things for free up front can result in things down the line. Now, getting back to the the Primal Carnage thing, though, because that uh, led to the following. So Primal Carnage came out, but also on the side, one of the developers who was working on Primal Carnage left to make his own game called In Momentum, which I also did the music for that because that director liked the music for, for I was doing for Primal Carnage and was like, do you want to do the score for this game? And I was like, yeah. And I got paid on the back end for that and kept 100% of the soundtrack royalties, which I'm still getting paid for today. Then uh, Primal Carnage came out and then three years later the director of primal carnage was making this game called mean greens now mean greens he also didn't have anything to pay me up front because uh because uh, he made a new company after primal carnage but he uh, was like i'll give you back end and i got even better back end and it's not just back end on the soundtrack it's like the game sales itself and i got back end on mean greens too and what i did on mean greens i recorded with a full orchestra even though there was no budget up front I spent a significant amount because this was four months after Ori had come out and I'd gotten my first check from Ori, which was enough to cover uh, a short orchestral recording session. And I paid for an orchestral recording session for Mean Greens. Now, that was a calculated gamble. I made a guess on what I thought Mean Greens would sell and uh, it doubled my expectations on what it would sell. And so I had not only made my money back, I also made a profit on a game which had zero budget and I spent money on a live orchestral session for. So that was another calculated gamble. And the result of that is I have an hour of live orchestral music as well. Continuing from the same director, uh, I promise this will end soon, um, but this all stems from like one director who like I worked for free. Um, this one director, the sound designer, he ended up leaving after Mean Greens um, actually no, during Mean Greens, to work for a company called Insomniac Games. And then uh, about six months later, maybe eight months later, I get a, I get a message from him from, on him from him on Skype. He's like, yeah, we've got this uh, cool VR project coming up. Would you like to pitch for it? <laughs> and so I pitched for it. And then, hey, like three months after that, I've got the unspoken. But best of all, I'm saving the best one for last. So... Uh, the director for Mean Greens, on the side, his company was doing all the creature design for a game called Ark Survival Evolved, and they needed a composer. And so I got pitched to be composer. And so not only did I get that gig through him, the doing the composition for Ark Survival Evolved eventually led to what I was doing in June, uh, at the end of May, which was recording at Abbey Road with 93 musicians. So that all stemmed from doing one thing for free back when I was struggling. And that's like the picture you've got to take. I'm probably going to do talk about this at GDC, like about on career development, because like literally one seed can grow into this ridiculous, like full blossoming flower. Um, and it's amazing how, I don't want to say incestuous, but like it kind of is because like you, when you work on a game, like people are aware of your music, like the, the artist, maybe they want to make a game one day or the sound designer, maybe he wants to make a game one day or the programmer, maybe he wants to make a game one day and they're all going to remember you. They're all going to branch out and like maybe do their own, their own thing. Um, so um, when you're starting out, you should never say no to anything because you just don't know who you are saying no to. Like, what if I'd said uh, at the beginning, sorry, I can't do your Primal Carnage game for free up front, uh, for free up front because I'm struggling for money. Um, like, that's where the audio jungle and the library music stuff helped me out because it, like, helped keep me afloat. Um, one thing I left out, <laughs> uh, it's also quite important, the other thing that kept me afloat, I got lucky with a trailer placement. I got a trailer placement on the King's Speech, um, which won several oscars um and that like kept me afloat for a long time um and solved several problems like like you need to you need to find like 
as many income streams as you can and like in this day and age there are so many like you can and and i'm not just talking about composing like if you've got tech skills there are composers who don't have tech skills if you've got orchestration skills trust me there are a lot of composers who need orchestration skills if you've got music preparation skills then go and do that for someone else if you've got mixing skills go and do that for someone else like there's lots of ways to make money as a composer not like necessarily using your actual composition skills but you've got to do something to keep yourself afloat in the meantime um so offer your services to other people um and you never know where it like might lead in 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 return um and uh but yeah the other th like don't don't ever put yourself in a position at the start of your career where you where you have to say no that's like that's 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 where things can fall apart very quickly like you should be saying yes to everything and especially if you're a student oh my goodness you have no excuse like you should be you should be working for free like when you're a student um and working for free is like this kind of weird thing because like usually there's something on the back end like that can be made available and if there's not something on the back end like exchange services or something like because the director of the project probably has some other skill that will help you down the line like if the director is a film director maybe they'll film one of your recording sessions for free like in five years like just build up this stack of favors that you can call in when you most need them i alluded to the fact that ori was a very low budget game um and trust me i called in every favor i possibly could for for ori because i knew it was going to be a reasonably successful game and that turned out to be a good decision um you know, whereas the Mean Greens thing was a calculated gamble, you've also got to sometimes you just got to take a risk and like put all your eggs in one basket and hope for the best. Um, but generally speaking, even if you do put your egg, all your eggs in one basket, if you've helped enough people, if you help other people, they'll be there to help you and help you keep keep you afloat like when 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 you're struggling. Um, but yeah, basically, don't say no, help other people. And honestly, it's about hard work. Um, there's this classic phrase where um hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard um and that's very 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 true like you can be the most talented person in the world but if you don't do the work it doesn't matter wow that's absolutely incredible so gareth i mean thank you so much for for dedicating an hour and 40 minutes it's been a marathon but a a great oh one God. at that I'm sorry. I'm I hope, well, I'll be amazed if people tune in for the whole thing. But uh, uh, no, well, what what I'll say is that if you've watched this whole thing, leave a comment below and say that you made it through it. And uh, me and Gareth <laughs> will alike both be incredibly impressed. And uh, and so yeah, so thank you so much just for for letting us in on all this stuff. And um, we all cannot wait to hear Ark Survival Evolved. I bet it'll be fantastic and badass and in your face. And you know that's that's. That's what we're all expecting, so I'm sure it'll be great. But yeah. but anyways, yeah, um, that advice is, is, is brilliant, and I'm sure that everyone, especially on the, uh, the GCN, is going to be very, very thankful for it. So thank you for being our first victim in the GCN interview series. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Gareth Coker. Uh, you can find his music on Amazon, on iTunes. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so thank you so much, and I will see you guys later.